I was 20 years of age, I managed to buy my first house. I saved about 5,000 pounds and I got a 12,000 pound mortgage and I managed to get my first house. See, that's one thing. I mean, that was your breakthrough. Another quick question for me once a of things from Mr. Chandrakant Gohil from linking in from the UK. Now, he says the UK is open for business right now. Have you got any plans to invest there at the moment? Well, I think UK is right, but I think to me, um, Africa has more opportunities uh, than, than uh, Europe at the moment. Um, according to me, uh, you know, Uganda especially, um, we find that there's a lot of oil that has been discovered in Uganda. And I think that we are just waiting for a final, final agreement between the government and the multinational like Total and China National Oil Corporation. Once they sign, they're going to invest around $15 billion into Uganda. So we feel that Uganda and other African countries have a huge opportunity. And just one thing I want to say, as an African billionaire, uh, not just as yourself, how do you perceive the African continent right now, in particular, uh, in a way of uh, amassing, not only amassing wealth, but also creating an impact? How do you perceive it? Well, you see, Western markets are saturated. There are many players doing the same thing. Now, when when you have an, <clears throat> your vision, uh, something you want to create, it is far, uh, uh, and, and you're exposed uh, as a person who's traveled a bit. So you can bring a lot of new ideas into Africa and, and, and you're able to implement those and make, make them into a reality far better than, than the rest of the world, I think. And Africa, as you know, it's got a population of 1.4 billion, probably ex, you know, growing by another 3%. Most of the resources are available in Africa and the opportunity for growth are phenomenal. How, how, how do you perceive these opportunities that you talk of as an African billionaire? How do you comprehend them and, and find them and identify them? Well, I think, first of all, there are things which, uh, you know, a growing economy uh, requires. Second thing, there's a very large middle class segment growing into, into African society and population. So, you know, people have disposable income, people have, uh, you know, they, they, they expose themselves, they all traveled, so the expectations are high. So all the time you need to create anything you do to meet the expectation of the very high standards. And, and we still are behind the rest of the world. So it's time to catch up uh, with new ideas here. Uh, just uh, before we uh, get on to the next question, I've got a couple of questions here from the audience. So on the same sort of lines, I'll put them together. Ivan Okuda and also um, Alex Esakala from Kampala. And they're asking the same sort of thing. What are the three life lessons you would share with young people who want to get on and follow in your footsteps? Well, first of all, when you have your vision of doing things in life, um, don't give up. You will not. You may not succeed first, second, or third time. Continue with it, but create a vision which you can achieve. Don't create a vision which is unachievable. And secondly, in my opinion, cr create and get into a, a, a line of business or entrepreneurship which you enjoy doing. Every day when you wake up in the morning, you go to your office, you want, you want to go to the office. Not that you, you, you are in a business because your friend is successful or somebody else. You, you come on, you notice and you, what do you like? Are you a people's person? Are you uh, an IT specialist? Whatever you are, but you must enjoy doing what you, you know, what you're doing and then how you can expand on that to make a living out of it. And um, also, again, uh, just getting down to the deals um, as well that African billionaires like yourself have struck. How do you interact and transact when you're going into a deal in Africa? Well, first of all, I think you need confidence in yourself. And, and, the, and the second thing is you must know the, what you're going to, in line of business you're going to, it will work. And 
how to implement it. You know, people talk about feasibility studies and all that. Honestly, in Africa, I feel that you, if you have a vision for something, you create it, and then you create demand for what you have created. I, you know, you, a lot of times people go to the banks and say, make a feasibility study. 99 out of 100 times in Africa, other than a established economy like South Africa, does not work. Do you think that there's no place for business plans here in Africa? No, you to have the you have to have a sense, six sense, which tells you if I do this, I will I, I will make it work. I will make it. Uh, I'll create a demand for what I'm doing. And that's how I've succeeded. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, it may not apply to other people, but in, in my even today, the projects I do, I know what I can create a demand for what I've done. I so say the questions are coming in thick and fast. There's a lot of people from your. Uh home country here asking and there's a gentleman there called Matthews from Premier Roses. Now he's saying as a fellow East African, what are your plans for expansion in other East African countries? He mentions Kenya, Rwanda and possibly Burundi in the future. I feel that uh, we're already in Rwanda. We have a quite a, a big investment in Rwanda. Uganda, I, I feel that this is an opportunity. One of the um, biggest expansion we are planning for is in agriculture in Uganda. One of my my business at the moment is growing roses. Uh, we are expanding, uh, we, are, we are producing around 350,000 roses per day. We have to expand it so that we can actually produce about a million roses every day and export them to Holland and Europe. So that is one line of business we are uh, very much uh, in, in target for. And of course the other agriculture uh, uh, products like avocados and macadonia nuts and vanilla, coca. So all these things are an opportunity where, despite having some of the most beautiful land on, on, on this globe, we have, Uganda is not actually, except sugar, we, have, we don't have organized uh, uh, agriculture uh, farms. Now, I've got another question here. I say we've got nearly 100 people online now. There's a lot of interest in this uh, this webinar. Uh, question here from Rachel uh, from uh, your own country, Kasangati. And she's saying, how do you know when you've reached the point of success or sort of break even in the business? How do you know that? I don't know when you, uh, how do you equate success? Um, is it the, the amount of money you create or the value you are sitting on? Well, I, I frankly, my success is when I see that I, I, I start a project, I create employment for people, and at the same time, um, you know, the people who are using our uh, uh, establishments are also making money from it. That is my success. And, you know, for all the time we, we create new products, we create new um, um, real estate developments and where people who are with you, they must make money. You, you should not make money alone. Because every time that you set up a new project, you have a line of people who want to invest with you. In a short time away, we were talking about roses, and I'll just ask this one before we move on. I'm curious too. Another question online. Someone's saying Valentine's Day is the big day of the year for rose sales. How does it affect? They're curious how it affects your business, and when do you feel the benefit? Is it now or three months hence, or how does it work? First of all, roses are very necessary in uh, in Europe. It's part of the culture. <coughs> And every household in this winter needs something to, um, you know, brighten up. So people, when they go to the supermarket, one of the first things they, they end up is to, is, is they walk to the, uh, where they sell flowers and roses. So it's quite an instinct for somebody to pick it up. And the other culture is that when you go and visit your families or your friends, you take a bouquet of flowers and a bottle of wine or chocolate for your mom. So it's part of the culture. So, you know, and, and, and Europe, and, 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 you will never stop the usage of flowers. We had an amazing and very successful um, uh, Valentine. We were lucky our, the sun came at the right time. 
all our production as we planned went out, so all the shipment went out. So I think we are very, very good. And I think even our staff will soon get a bonus um, um, for the hard work they did. Because we, That's good. for Rose Industry, we give them a bonus during after Valentine. So they have to work hard and support as a team and everybody is going to laugh. Okay. Well, there's, there's one other question before we move on here from Pretty Sasha Masak, also from Uganda. She says she calls you the most inspiring man in Uganda. Now, the question for you is, if you were my shoes today with a capital of $10,000, what would you invest in? I think I would actually, uh, at, at the moment, to invest in a new venture, I would let the COVID thing settle. Um, and in the meantime, there will be a lot of opportunities coming. You see, during COVID, you have certain opportunities, and pre-COVID was a different opportunity. You know, um, during COVID, if you go into mask making, you could start with a small business, and you know, uh, the, de the demand was there, but I think we will miss that boat. Um, but with the $10,000, you could have started making masks. You know, the whole home industry of, of, of doing so. And all the hygiene um, products that, you know, sanitizers and all those things would have, you would have the opportunity. But I think sanitizers will be here to stay for another few years. It's still an opportunity to get into. It doesn't take much money. Um, needs a bit more, uh, uh, you know, uh, thinking. Because there are many players now. Um, but at the moment, there are a lot of businesses which are have not taken off. Is to pick up one of those businesses which are down because now at the, at the bottom of the graph and pick them up. Now the economy is going to come up. So I think this, those are the things I would I would do. A, I, I had a friend uh, who, who called me and said, "Look, I I want to start a hotel. Where can I start a hotel?" I said, "Listen, if I was you." There are so many hotels on sale. Pick one up and nourish it, and 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 this is the time to get into it. So there's a lot of opportunities which people have failed during COVID, and you as a second owner will be more successful than the first owner. So those are the opportunities we should pick up now. We have picked up so many real estate in the last uh, two three months at, at rock bottom prices, and and give next 10, 12 months, it will triple in prices. For people who have like $10,000 and less, you know, who are starting right at the very bottom, what's your advice in how to bootstrap a business from nothing? Well, I, I think one of the things you, you can actually join the chain of uh, uh, distribution of, of agriculture from the, from the farmers to the cities, it's an, it's a, because you see, any commodities you, you purchase, plus it is value of cash. And it is something that you can actually um, pick that opportunity of setting up your network. With, with you know, $10,000 in these days is not a lot of money, unfortunately. But to, to start small, you know, you, is to buy from the farmers and sell it in the cities and set up your own distribution and, and and as the market settles you actually can make a lot of money so um while we're on the subject of starting businesses a question here from prane powell now she says i or he or she says so i left uganda in 1972 at the age of nine uh is there a lot of red tape to establish a business in uganda and can this be overcome by a newcomer first of all i think you know uganda is an amazing country um, and, 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 you know, there, there's certain minimum uh, requirements by licensing. If you're in pharmaceutical, you need certain licenses from the medical things. But once you have those, and they're not difficult to get, you just have to fulfill minimum requirement. And, and most of the government agencies, you're going to be very helpful. Once you set them up and you, you, run, you run your business in your own regulated way, there's not an issue. Uganda probably is one of the least bureaucratic countries in the world. But you have to fulfill certain minimum requirements. And, and honestly, um, the, there's going to be $15 billion investment in this country. 
it will last for another five years and then oil will come in and after oil they're going to have a, a refinery once you have a refinery and try and, and imagine that with the refinery you will have 100 byproducts of petroleum you know bitumen petroleum jelly plastic petrochemicals fertilizers and and petroleum jelly that unlimited amount of new industry will come out so if you are, have any interest in any of those this is the time to come set yourselves up and you know you will not regret and, and you see uganda's population is now 46 million people and our population grows around three and a half percent by annum. so every year we have 1.2 million babies you can see even the growth alone and and, and uganda's ge geographical position is very privileged one we're in the heart of africa we are surrounded by about five six countries sudan uh, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, which is one of the biggest markets. So, you know, the opportunities are there. In the last 20 years, Uganda has had 5,000 new industries in this country. 5,000 industries producing goods for not only Uganda, but the region. So please, anybody who wants to invest money, come bring your money and create jobs for people, and, and you may have a win-win situation. The government is helpful. There are a lot of tax uh, uh, benefits in the um, in, 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 in the uh, in, uh, exporting zones. The government will give five, ten years uh, tax-free duty, uh, in uh, tax-free imports, and also when you make profit for five or ten years, you don't pay any taxes. So you can't get a better support from the government. There's another question from your hometown. Grace Kentaro says there's a trending debate in Uganda at the moment about educated versus those who are not educated. And that the educated, in fact, don't know how to make money and get rich. Now, her concern is how to advise the young generation in which way is the best to succeed in life. She says, kindly, can you throw some light on this? Well, first of all, I think I, I would beg to defer because in this, in Uganda for the last 20 years, government has given free education to primary and maybe 15 years now for free education to secondary. So we still have a very large population which is um, educated with a basic education. Then there's the elite who are extremely, extremely qualified and, and, and highly educated. The problem is when you are sometimes too qualified, you to take a risk sometimes is uh, you always look for a secure job, probably with government, with NGO, or um, uh, you know, aid agencies. So I think you need to come out of the box and and dirty your hands and create your own opportunity. Well, we've got 110 people online, including people from London, Canada, all over the world. One of the questions here clearly from an entrepreneur, Mr. BJ or Tetra. Now he says. Um, He's a friend of yours, but he says, what's your morning routine as an entrepreneur? How do you deal with stress? And how do you get yourself to peak performance as an entrepreneur? Well, I think uh, um, when you, in, 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 in your life, stress is part of your daily routine. But I, 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 don't, I, I don't let the stress overcome me. I, I you know, in, in Africa, you, you, you have what you call can't structure your management like you do in a, a you know a established country like UK or America or something. You can plan yourselves and things will happen and you can anticipate. In Africa is what you call management by crisis. So in the morning when you wake up, you have crisis and you deal with that manage you manage this crisis to start with. Then you start your day to day work. And in, in, in the English term, we say management by crisis. So you wake up in the morning, if you have any of your businesses have, uh, you know, uh, 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 issues, you, you firefight this. After firefighting goes, then you get to your office and you deal, deal with your emails. And, and then in the afternoon, you, you, you plan for your expansion. Uh, in terms of um, when you come to a deal as an entrepreneur or a new venture, I'd like to know, how do you assess risk when you're going into something? What sort of little benchmark things do you do? Well, first of all, 
like every other businessman, I work out my rate on, on return of my investment. And if I don't get certain amount of return on my investment, I would not touch it. Then I look for another opportunity. So every business that we look into is to say, will, will I give 18% return on my investment or 20% or 25%? And then I work out what is a juicy deal for me and I what we work on that. I sit with my, my, my daughter and my son and we, they know exactly how to work those things out with me. Uh, and then they, they prepare the project and, uh, and, and they come with the final figures I look through because I've trained them to do so. And, and they know exactly what my expectations are and the company's expectation. And someone else is curious here online with a growing audience we're getting. They're saying that they're very curious to know what you think are the most common mistakes people make in business. 